This is Reading Reveries and I am your host Kasturi. Hello and welcome to this new episode where you and I together lose ourselves in a little bit of reading for the next few minutes. July and we're still in the throes of the coronavirus pandemic, leading restricted lifestyles, going places is difficult than has been ever before and I am craving for a train ride to some place. While that's not an option, I thought I could share an armchair train ride with you here while reading John Betjeman's Back to the Railway Carriage. The poet laureate of the United Kingdom from 1972 to 1984, John Betjeman had an inclination for nostalgia, rooted not in the long ago but in the relatively shallow soil of the recent decades. He's a blend of wit, whimsy criticism, along with nostalgia. Benjamin is well known as Britain's national romancer, for whom nothing was ugly. His romance with British topography and landscape, his passionate defence of Victorian architecture, extended to the railways, so much so, helped save St. Pancras Railway Station from demolition. Railways are a constant motive in his works be they poetry or radio broadcasts or documentary films? No, I will not bore you with a list, but here are a few suggestions from a puny betchamaniac. Bershaw Station or a liverish journey first class, the Metropolitan Railway and distant view of a provincial town are a few of my favourite poems by John Betjeman on the railways along with the 1962 documentary film John Betjeman Goes by Train, apart from others like Let's Imagine a Branch Line Railway with John Betjeman and Railways Forever. And of course, this lovely broadcast we are going to listen to in this episode called Back to the Railway Carriage, which was first aired on the 10th of March 1940. It will make you long for a ride on a steam train through the green countryside, a little bit of gossip and the hooting and chugging and the charm of it all. Let's get back to the railway carriage with John Betjeman. Home service, Sunday, 10th March, 1940. Producer, J. C. Benethorn Hughes. This is an odd thing to ask you to do on a fine Sunday morning, but I want you to imagine yourself in the waiting room of a railway station on a wet evening. You know the sort of room, let me recall it, a wind whistling down the platform, a walk battling against the breeze to the door marked, general waiting room, the vast interior, the black horsehair benches and chairs, the mahogany table, the grate with its winking fire, the large framed photographs of yellowing views of crowded esplanades and ivy-mantled ruins, the framed advertisement for the company's hotel at Strathmacrega, electric light, exquisite cuisine, lift to all floors within five minutes of sea and fire. The gaslight roaring, a friendly buzz of restless conversation of other people also awaiting trains. Just such a scene as this, which may be witnessed this very evening at a hundred junctions lost among the suburbs of industrial towns or far away in the country where branch line meets main line, just such a scene as this was witnessed 60, 70, 80 years ago. I shall have the railways complaining that I am calling them Victorian. Let them complain. They are Victorian. That is their beauty. But they aren't only Victorian, they're Edwardian and modern as well. Now they are here, I hope they'll never be taken away and 
I, for one, am grateful for the opportunity these times have given me of using them again, more than I did in the old patrol-clouded civilization of before the war. Think yourself back into that waiting room and learn with me the first lesson the railway teaches us, to pay a proper respect to the past. Railways were built to last, none of your discarding last year's model and buying this one's. That horsehair seat has supported the Victorian bustle, the frock coat of the merchant going citywards first class, your father in his best sailor suit when he was being taken to the seaside, and now it is supporting you and it's far from worn out. That platform has seen the last farewells of sons and parents, has watched the city man returning home to break the news to his wife that he's bankrupt, has watched his neighbour come in a new suit one morning and with a first class instead of a third class ticket. Turn from human history to the history of stone and steam and iron. The railway station in the old days was a monument to science. Euston, whose fine Doric portico, one of London's noblest buildings, was the new gateway to the north, King's Cross, whose simple outlines are a fortress of all that is good in modern architecture, Temple Meads, Bristol, in the Tudor style, far from gym crack but cut out of local stone. Newcastle Central Station, a lovely classical building worthy of ancient Rome, and many a lesser station. I know little stations among the Shropshire Hills built in solid but picturesque Gothic style to tone in with the romantic scenery. I know of huge suburban stations that are dusty from disuse and full of top-hatted posts in the corners of echoing gaslit booking halls. Best of all, I know that station in Cornwall I loved as a boy. The oil lights, the smell of seaweed floating up the estuary, the rain-washed platform and the sparkling Cornish granite and the hedges along the valleys around soon to be heavy with blackberries. I think of Edward Thomas's lovely poem, Adelstrop, on a country station in the Cotswolds. Yes, I remember Adel's drop. The name, because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwontedly. It was late June. The steam hissed, someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adel's drop, only the name. That verse recalls one of the deeper pleasures of a country railway station, its silence broken only by the crunching of a porter's feet on the gravel, the soft country accent of the station master, and the crash bang of a milk can somewhere at the back of the platform. The train, once in the centre of a noisy town, has drifted into the deep, heart of the English country, with country noises brushing the surfaces of a deeper silence. Edward Thomas expressed this in the last stanza of his poem on Adelstrop Station. And for that minute a blackbird sang close by, and round him mistier, farther and farther, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. For if you want to see and feel the country, travel by train. Roads are determined by boundaries of estates and by villages and other roads. They're shut in by hedges, peppered with new villas, garish with tin signs, noisy with road houses. A town spreads out along its roads for miles, leaving the country in the fields at the back that you don't see. From Reading to London, it's down almost all the way by road. Yet, by rail, the country creeps surprisingly near to London. 
This is because railways are built regardless of natural boundaries and from the height of an embankment we can see the country undisturbed as one who walks along an open footpath through a field. Roads bury themselves in the landscape. The railways carve out a landscape of their own. Ninety years ago, some of the best artists were proud to draw the scenery of railways, their stations, viaducts, banks and cuttings and locomotives. The large railway arc over the road at Chippenham was one of the wonders of the West. Now it's covered with advertisements so that you can't see it. Railways were built to look from and to look at. They still provide those pleasures for the eye. Personally, I don't like new smart jazz expresses with cocktail bars and heat which to me is stifling. I like an old bumpy carriage with a single gas light in the ceiling. That peculiar design only known to railways on the upholstery, views of Tenby, Giant's Causeway, Morecambe Bay, Barler Lake and so on under the rack marked for light articles only. I like to see a loop of upholstered leather in the corner seats of first-class carriages into which you are meant to put your arm should the train travel fast. I've never seen one of these loops used by a passenger but I'm told that they are a survival of old coaching days. As you know, the earliest covered passenger compartments were little more than post traces clamped together and fastened down onto a four-wheeled tramway wagon. Sometimes, inside old Landau taxis that fly from country stations to the rectory, these loops survive. They are the sole relic in motors of Georgian days. I like a locomotive with a brass dome and the arms of the railway company and all its splendid Victorian heraldry on the tender. I think the railway companies are making a great mistake in trying to imitate the streamlining of motor cars, the gashes and cubes of pseudo-modern fabrics and the upholstery and other futile devices to appear up to date. Railways are essential, and this new surface decoration is, it seems to me, quite unnecessary. There have been a fine tradition of solid Victorian beauty that they're trying to destroy. One company is spoiling the look of its engines with a new and hideous monogram and distorted lettering designed to save space. This seems to me to be spoiling the engine for a habit of paint. But of course I know that I may be in a minority about this. No doubt thousands of people love it. You need never be bored in a train. You can always read a book and an even more interesting book to read than that on your knee is the faces and habits of your fellow passengers. I know the type so well. The fussy type, the old person who wraps a travelling rug round his knees and gets up to lean out of the window at every station and ask if this is the right train for Evercreech, receiving the answer yes every time. He continues to look out as though that his anxious face will cause the guard to blow his whistle sooner. The vacant fool who taps with his toes on the floor and whistles to hide his embarrassment when the train comes to an unexpected halt between stations. The talkative person who tries to get into conversation, the war has brought on a big increase in this type on general topics. I very much enjoy listening to the battle of wits in which people try to avoid being caught into the talk. Colder today, isn't it? Yes. But the days will be getting longer soon. Silence. Anyone here know whether this is right for Bristol? Oh yes. I suppose we'd stop at Ditkit, Swindon and Bath. Mr. Noel struggles between a desire to go on with his book and a desire to correct the speaker, his desire to correct winds. You've left out Chippenham. We stop at Chippenham and I think at two other stations. Me? Yes, at Shallow and Uffington. Ah, thank you to Mr. Noel. Pretty place, Chippenham. Yes, they're off. 
But the greatest gift the railways gave to us is the proper treatment of time. Of course, there are expresses that will hurdle you from place to place in no time, but the others no longer that many are forgetting from one town to another, avoiding along a tarmac road at 60 miles an hour. But a leisurely journey, seeing the country getting to the place much sooner and much more comfortably in the long run and with the pleasant discipline of having to catch a train at a stated time. And if the train is a bit late, what matter? There are one's fellow passengers to study the unfamiliar view of a place one knows well from the road seen at an odd angle from the railway. The photographs below the rack to see, the railway noises to listen to, and for me there's the pleasure of a railway timetable. It's one of the ironies of this war that the centenary of Bradshaw, which occurred last November, should have been obscured by the war. The original Bradshaw was a Quaker and a great worker for peace. How I enjoy his pages, particularly those at the end that deal with the great southern railway in Ayr. Stops to take up at any junction hold on Thursdays and Saturdays. Any junction hold is hidden away among the footnotes of Bradshaw. What romance there is in the name. For any junction is a station lost in an Irish bog in the middle of Westmead. There's no road to it, nothing but miles of meadow sweet and bog myrtle, and here and there the green patch and white speck of a distant Irish small holding, and the silence is only livened by rumblings of distant turf carts and the hiss of a waiting great southern engine on Thursdays and Saturdays. Trains were made for meditation. Meditation here may think down hours to moments. Here the heart may learn a useful lesson from the head, and learning wiser grow without his books. From the task book, sixth. To quote Cooper, who was writing about something else, and I advise slow trains on branch lines, half-empty trains that go through meadows in the evening and stop at each once oil-lit hold. Time and war slip away and you are lost in the heart of England. When I was a boy, the old North London Railway stopped running on Sundays during church time. It's about to strike 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning and I must be stopping too. That was John Benjamin's Back to the Railway Carriage for you. Quiet, charming, nostalgic, it always transports me to the Victorian times or the Edwardian times. No one conjures railway journeys like John Benjamin. That'll be all for today's episode. Do get in touch and let me know your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining in today. Be sure to tune in for another episode of Reading Reverie soon. Until then, keep well and have a good day.